I'm Dr. Fakir Rabari and this is Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics of Aminoglycosides in Adults. Our first learning objective is given a patient with stable renal function, calculate estimated creatinine clearance using the cockcroft galt equation. Because aminoglycosides are almost exclusively cleared renally, it is important to be able to assess renal function. Let's take a look at what happens in the nephron. Generally speaking, there are three things that happen. Filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. Glomerular filtration is a passive process that occurs in the Bowman's capsule. During this process, water and small ions and molecules, including drugs, diffuse passively into the lumen. Secretion is, a, is an active process that occurs mostly in the proximal tubule. There are many transporters involved that secrete substances into the tubule. And finally, there is reabsorption, which is also an active process and it mostly occurs in the distal tubule. The best way to assess renal function is to measure glomerular filtration rate or GFR. Now you can either measure GFR or you can estimate it using equations. Measure GFR is the best index of renal function. And when measuring GFR, we want to use a substance that is filtered only and is not secreted and it's not reabsorbed because we are only measuring the filtration process. Inulin is a substance that's clinically available and is used primarily by nephrologists, but it's not routinely used in clinical practice because it's expensive and it's not readily available outside of uh, nephrology. Therefore, oftentimes we have to estimate GFR and there are equations that we can use, including MDRD and CKD epi. These equations are validated in patients with CKD specifically and MDRD tends to underestimate GFR in general. So CKD epi happens to be a more accurate equation compared to MDRD. Another thing that we can do to assess renal function is to use creatinine clearance as an approximation of GFR. And just like GFR, when it comes to creatinine clearance, we can either measure it or we can estimate. The way that we measure creatinine clearance is by actually collecting urine. Typically, the best way to do it is to collect urine for a 24 hour period and then get a urine creatinine level as well as a serum creatinine level and use this equation to, uh, to get the actual creatinine clearance. As you can imagine, this process of collecting urine for 24 hours might not be practical. And if we collect urine for a shorter period of time, let's say over four hours, it becomes more practical, but it reduces um, accuracy. So another thing that we can do, we can actually estimate creatinine clearance using cockcroft galt equation, which typically overestimates GFR. Again, creatinine clearance is only intended to approximate GFR, so it is not an actual GFR. Some limitations of creatinine is that creatinine, not only is it filtered, but it's also secreted and eliminated by gut bacteria. It depends on muscle mass, nutrition, age, and drug interactions, and it typically lags in the setting of acute renal change. So creatinine clearance can only be used in stable renal function. Here's how this equation was developed. In the 1970s, two colleagues, Cockcroft and Galt, did a study at the VA which included 96 uh, percent uh, male patients and they did 24 hour urine collection and from their data they derived an equation and because most of their patients were male they did a correction for uh, deriving an equation in females again avoid use of this equation in patients with unstable renal function for example if the patient has AKI this equation is not valid because in this study that they derived this equation everybody had stable renal function. Although in the original equation, they used the total body weight, it's been suggested that total body weight may not be the best estimation for every patient. So typically, we actually calculate ideal body weight, which are these equations. When it comes to patients who actually are less than 60 in inches tall, it's suggested to use uh, these numbers for ideal body weight. Of course, you should always use clinical judgment. One thing that I have seen uh, clinicians do is, uh, for example, if somebody somebody's height is 58 inches, they would 
use a negative 2 in these equations to actually subtract. There are no universal guidelines on how to approach this in different patients, so you may work with different clinicians who approach this differently. For the purpose of this class, we will use these equations. You might wonder what about patients who, who have had amputation. For those patients, you can actually use this chart in order to subtract uh, from the ideal body weight whatever limb they're, they're missing. For example, if somebody had below the knee amputation, you can actually subtract 6% of the ideal body weight that you calculate. These numbers are just for your uh, reference, so you do not need to memorize these percentages for patients with amputation. For patients who are obese, and obese is defined as a BMI of greater than 30, or a total body weight that is about 20 to 30 percent over or i should say at least 20 to 30 percent over ideal body weight and the reason there is a range here is because different studies have used different cutoffs so some studies have used 20 as the cutoff and some studies have used 30. again there is no universal guideline on how to do this but this, uh, these are the ranges that are typically used in clinical uh, practice for the purpose of this class, we will not have a case that's in the middle of this. So you will either have a patient whose total body weight is more than 30% or less than 20%. And then for the actual equation to calculate adjusted body weight, there are different uh, factors uh, described in the literature. Again, for the purpose of this class, we're going to use the 40%. So we're going to use this equation in this class to calculate adjusted body weight. But I'm just showing you that there are other equations out there. So when you are in um, uh, on rotations, you may work with uh, preceptors that may use different equations. Uh, so again, there is no universal guideline on what you should do. You should use your judgment. And for this class, we will use this equation. And of course, when it comes to bodybuilders, you know, uh, even though their BMI may look like it's uh, too high, or if their total body weight is more than 20 to 30 percent, that's typically their muscle. So you may not actually have to uh, calculate adjusted body weight, but always you use your clinical judgment. So going back to the Cockcroft-Galt equation, if someone is underweight, meaning that their total body weight is less than their ideal body weight, you should use total body weight in the Cockcroft-Galt equation. Someone who has a normal weight, meaning that they weigh at least their ideal body weight, but less than 1.3 times the ideal body weight, uh, you should use the ideal body weight in the Cockcroft-Galt equation. And of course, someone who's obese, and if for the purpose of this class, we're going to use the cutoff of, of 1.3 times the ideal body weight, uh, you should uh, calculate the adjusted body weight and use the adjusted body weight in the cockcroft gold equation. Now, these are for the pur purpose of this class. Uh, you know, there are no universal guidelines. So if you come with, uh, you know, always follow what your uh, preceptor tells you. And of course, beyond graduation, always use your own clinical judgment to decide what to do in your practice. And of course, there are clinicians who round serum creatinine of less than one to one in elderly. Uh, you know, a common thing that's out there is if a patient is uh, 60 years old or older and serum creatinine is less than one, um, I have seen clinicians round it to one uh, just because elderly have less muscle. Because of less muscle, that serum creatinine might artificially be low. Now, in the literature, this is generally not recommended because you tend to underestimate creatinine clearance. So it is not recommended to round serum creatinine elderly. Now, there are situations that you may uh, need to round. So, And in the literature, it's recommended to round to 0.8. So if serum creatinine is less than 0.8, round it to 0.8. Uh, not necessarily for elderly, but for malnourished because serum creatinine comes from muscle. So if someone has low albumin or low protein, that could be an indicator of malnutrition. Or someone who just happens to have very low muscle mass, uh, for example, or someone who's uh, uh, paraplegic, um, for those patients, uh, you, you may round serum creatine of less than 0.8 to 0.8, but still use your clinical judgment. We looked at estimating creatinine clearance using the cockcroft gold equation. Now, the next learning objective is explain the mechanism of action and toxicodynamic properties of aminoglycosides. Most aminoglycosides are natural products that naturally exist in nature. And the naming of these aminoglycosides are actually based on the organism that they are derived from. So streptomycin, neomycin, and tobromycin are actually derived from streptomyces species. We also have gentamicin, which is derived from macromonospora species. 
We also have a couple of aminoglycosides, amikacin and polyzomycin that are semi-synthetic derivatives. So these are actually developed in the lab. Aminoglycosides are available as IV formulation with the exception of neomycin which is available as PO and there is also a cream formulation. Aminoglycosides have concentration dependent rapid bactericidal activity against gram negative organisms. They inhibit protein synthesis by primarily binding to the 30S subunit of the ribosome. For more details of pharmacology of aminoglycoside, please refer to the pharmacology toolbox and watch the video that Dr. Wen has uh, developed for aminoglycoside pharmacology. In this picture, we're looking at a typical bacterial cell. You can see that inside the cell, there is a circular chromosome along with uh, multiple plasmids. There are also multiple ribosomes. In prokaryotes, we have 70S ribosomes. So all of these 70S ribosomes are floating inside the cytoplasm. Now the 70S ribosome is the primary site of action of aminoglycosides. The 70S ribosome consists of a 50S subunit along with the 30S subunit. Aminoglycosides in particular bind to the 30S subunit. The function of the ribosome is to translate messenger RNA into a polypeptide. So these amino acids will come into the ribosome and based on the genetic code form a polypeptide chain. An aminoglycoside will interrupt this translation process. Now, note that ribosomes are inside the cell and in order for aminoglycoside to work, they actually need to go inside the cell first and then find this ribosome and inhibit protein synthesis. In this picture, we're looking at the cell wall of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The primary difference between gram-positive and gram-negative organisms is the outer membrane that exists in gram-negative organisms. So there, is, there are two layers in gram-negative cell wall. There is the plasma membrane followed by a tiny layer of peptidoglycan and then the outer membrane. Gram-positive organisms on the other hand, they have the plasma membrane followed by a thick layer of peptidoglycans and there is no outer membrane. And because there is no out, outer membrane, this peptidoglycan layer can actually grow and get thicker. The reason this is significant is because aminoglycosides are polar and they cannot penetrate through the peptidoglycan layer. In order for them to get inside the cell down here, they actually need to use either porine channels or use uh, carrier proteins. In other words, aminoglycosides cannot simply penetrate through these layers. Therefore, aminoglycosides are active primarily against gram-negative organisms because they can go through these porine channels and there is a tiny layer of peptidoglycan that they can go through and then they can go through more porins and get inside the cell where the ribosomes are. When it comes to gram-positives, because aminoglycoside cannot get through peptidoglycan, they do not have activity against gram-positive organisms on their own. However, we can use aminoglycoside for synergy with other antibiotics. And those other antibiotics typically are active against peptidoglycan layers. So if the other antibiotic will break down this peptidoglycan layer, then and only then aminoglycoside can get inside the cell and act on uh, ribosomes and give synergistic uh, effect with the other antibiotic. So when it comes to the spectrum of activity of aminoglycosides, uh, for gram-positive organisms in general, like streptococci, enterococci, and staphylococci, they do not have activity on their own, but you can uh, use them in combination with other antibiotics that are active against, uh, against the cell wall, uh, and that would be considered synergy. Now, when it comes to gram-negative organisms, aminoglycoside have excellent activity. So that includes Haemophilus influenzae, Enterobacteriaceae, and as well as uh, Pseudomonas. Aminoglycosides do not have activity against anaerobes and do not have activity against atypical organisms. So in summary, aminoglycosides bind to the 30S subunit of the ribosome, which inhibits protein synthesis. They can also cause cell wall disruption. This results in bactericidal effects. Some of the adverse effects of aminoglycosides include uh, nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, and neuromuscular blockade. The nephrotoxicity is actually reversible, but uh, very serious. Even short usage of aminoglycoside can result in nephrotoxicity, especially in elderly patients. Autotoxicity can also happen, which 
uh, which is actually irreversible. Neuromuscular blockade is not as common as nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity, and it typically occurs in association with anesthetics or the administration of other neuromuscular blocking agents in patients. We estimated creatinine clearance, we looked at the mechanism of action and toxicodynamic properties of aminoglycosides. Now, the next learning objective is describe the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of aminoglycosides. Let's review what pharmacokinetics means. Traditionally, pharmacokinetics is known as what the body does to the drug. It basically involves ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. It's important to consider absorption so we know the bioavailability of drugs. When it comes to distribution, it's important to know protein binding. So for example, some patients may have low albumin. Albumin is the number one protein that binds antibiotics. When it comes to metabolism, it is important to know if the, specifically a drug is metabolized with the CYP enzyme. That could include drug interactions. And of course, when it comes to elimination, it's uh, important to consider renal uh, biliary and fecal clearance. Now when we say clinical pharmacokinetics, we basically mean application of these pharmacokinetic principles to safe and effective therapeutic management of drugs in individual patients. And the goal is enhancing efficacy while decreasing toxicity. What about pharmacodynamics? Pharmacodynamics is actually what the drug does to the body. In the case of antimicrobials, the body refers to the pathogen. So we don't really want the drug to do anything to the human body. So once a drug is given to a patient, the body will handle the drug. So there will be absorption, distribution, and elimination. So this is the pharmacokinetic uh, properties. And then there will be concentration in the body fluids and also at the site of infection. And then at the site of infection is when you want the drug to do something to the pathogens. And that will be the... Uh, pharmacodynamic outcomes which we refer to as PKPD and of course there are things that antibiotics do to the body and those are referred to as toxicodynamics these are the things that we don't really want antibiotics to do to the body here are some important parameters to know on the horizontal axis we're looking at time and on the vertical axis we're looking at concentration of drug so once a drug is given at uh, the end of infusion you get the maximum concentration and that's referred to as peak or C max and then once we start the inf stop the infusion the body starts to clear it so the concentration goes down until it's time for the next dose at that time we have the minimum concentration or trough also referred to as C men and then the next dose is given and the drug goes up and then uh, at the end of infusion the body starts to clear there's also the concept of area under the curve which is all the shaded area here for a 24 hour period. So from, so it doesn't matter how frequently you give the dose, the AUC is often from time zero to 24 hours. So if, you know, if, if this drug was given once a day, you would only have one of these over 24 hours. Also, if this drug was given every eight hours, then you would have three of these peaks. But regardless, AUC is the area under the curve for a 24 hour period. And of course you could get the level at any time between peak and trough and that will be considered a random level. Now, when it comes to antibiotic, these things only tell you how the body is handling the drug. So, it, so you know, whether it's AUC or the peak or the trough, it's basically telling you how much drug is left in the body at a specific time. It doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the um, pharmacodynamics of the drug because it doesn't really tell you anything about the organism and we need to know something about the organism and what we need to know about the organism is the MIC or the minimum inhibitory co uh, concentration we can combine these pharmacokinetic parameters with MIC to get PKPD in indices so the three commonly used are the peak to MIC ratio the AUC to MIC ratio or the time above MIC. So when the concentration goes above this MIC concentration, it will go above and then eventually it will go down and then go below the MIC. The time it takes to go above the MIC and then below the MIC, that's referred to as time above MIC. Bioavailability of aminoglycosides is negligible. Basically, less than 5% is absorbed. Therefore, majority of aminoglycosides are IV formulations. So the oral formulation are typically not available because not enough of it is absorbed for systemic infection. So when we do use oral aminoglycosides because it is not absorbed, it's primarily for a GI purposes. For most patients, the volume of distribution of aminoglycosides are 0.25 liters per kilogram. 
and we will use these numbers when we get to the calculations portion of this topic. Aminoglycosides are primarily excreted renally and the half-life is about two hours in someone with normal renal function. However, in someone with renal impairment, the half-life could be between 50 to 70 hours. In this picture, on the horizontal axis, we're looking at time and the units of time are hour. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at the, in the log drop in the CFU or colony forming units of bacterial growth. So CFUs are basically units of measuring how much bacteria grow on culture. So in all three of these experiments, we have a control. So the red circles are control, meaning that if we don't use any antibiotics, we just let the organism uh, grow. So as time goes on, bacteria grow in the absence of antibiotics. Now the question is, if we start to introduce antibiotics, how much does it um, prevent growth of bacteria. MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration of a specific antibiotic for a specific organism. So in these experiments, we're giving antibiotics in increasing concentration and see how much increasing the concentration affect the growth. So for example, on the left hand side, we're looking at the antibiotic tobramycin. So if we give a quarter of the MIC, as time goes on, you can see that the growth of bacteria slows down, but doesn't completely uh, prohibit it. Now, if we gave uh, exactly at MIC concentration, as you, you can see that as the time uh, goes on, bacteria start to die. So actually the colony forming units start to drop. Now at higher concentration, so for example, at four MICs, you can see that bacteria uh, bacterial growth actually drops faster and as we increase the concentration this drop in growth of bacteria becomes uh, larger and larger this suggests that tobramycin has concentration dependent killing meaning that the more of a concentration of tobramycin that we use the more the growth of this organism was dropped now let's look at ciprofloxacin ciprofloxacin we uh, they did the same experiment so you can see that as they increase the concentration of ciprofloxacin more and more of the organism died as time went on. Now compare that to tacrocillin, which is a beta-lactam. Now as, it as they increase the concentration of this beta-lactam, you can see that the organism dropped, but at some point, increasing the concentration didn't make a difference anymore. So for example, once we, re we reach a concentration four times the MIC, we got the maximum amount of killing. So 16 times the MIC in negligible amounts. In fact, a concentration 24 times the MIC made no difference compared to 16 times MIC. And this suggests that beta-lactams do not have concentration dependent killing. Whereas tobramycin, which is an aminoglycoside, and ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, these two show concentration dependent killing because at the highest concentration of these antibiotics resulted in the most amount of killing. So generally speaking, antibiotics can be uh, divided into concentration dependent and concentration independent killing. Now we're looking at the evolution of um, PKPD. So as time went on, then clinicians started to refer to concentration dependent as time dependent. So we had concentration dependent and then we had time dependent. And as I showed you the examples of fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides, those are concentration dependent. And then the time dependent would be the beta-lactams as well as vancomycin. And the PKPD parameter for uh, time dependent, specifically for beta-lactam, is the time above MIC. So it's not necessarily the concentration of beta-lactams, it's more of how long the concentration is above the MIC that would result in maximum killing of organisms. Now compare that to concentration dependent. So if you have a high concentration, uh, uh, you know, the ratio of uh, co uh, peak concentration to MIC, the higher this concentration will result to the maximum amount of killing. And then there's the concept of AUC or area under the curve to MIC ratio which is uh, used for uh, aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones, which I will explain more. But this AUC to MIC is also used for vancomycin. So generally speaking, peak to MIC ratio is used for concentration dependent, and time above MIC is used for time dependent. 
And then AUC2 MIC, it just depends. For some antibiotics, AUC2 MIC means concentration dependent. And for some antibiotics, such as vancomycin, it just means time dependent. In this picture, we're looking at the concentration time curve. So on the horizontal axis, we're looking at time. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at concentration. The time above MIC, which is used for time dependent antibiotics, primarily beta lactams, uh, is the pharmacodynamic parameters for beta lactams. And we like to target the time above MIC of 40 to 60% of the dosing interval. Now, the ratio of peak to MIC is used for concentration dependent antibiotics such as aminoglycoside. So our goal is to have a peak to MIC to be eight to 10 times the MIC. So you want the peak to be eight to 10 times the MIC. So if the MIC happens to be one, we want the peak to be uh, 8 to 10, so 10 for example. Whereas if the MIC happens to be 2, then you want the peak to be 20. So 10 times 2 would be 20. And then we have the concept of AUC2 MIC, which we will talk about more when we talk about vancomycin. And AUC2 MIC is primarily used for vancomycin, as that's basically the area under the curve. So this whole, so it would be all of this area. This would be the AUC. Now, another thing that's specific for aminoglycoside is that is the concept of um, post-antibiotic effect. Post-antibiotic effect means that when the concentration went above the MIC, the antibiotic starts to kill. And then once the concentration goes below the MIC, the antibiotic continues to kill for some period of time. So as you can see from here to here, the aminoglycoside continues to kill and that's referred to post-antibiotic effect. Now here are some uh, PKPD targets for um, commonly used antibiotics. So for aminoglycosides, the best PKPD target is AUC to MIC, specifically for non-critically ill patients is 30 to 50 and for critically a uh, ill patients is 80 to 100. However, doing AUC to MIC at bedside is not practical. So most clinicians actually do the peak to MIC because you can easily get the peak level. And once you have the MIC, you can actually see if it's 10 times uh, the MIC. So for the purpose of this class, we're going to do the peak to MIC uh, for our monitoring of aminoglycosides. And we have another day dedicated to vancomycin calculations, which we will discuss at that time. We looked at mechanism of action and PKPD of aminoglycosides. Now the next learning objective is given a patient with a suspected gram-negative infection, determine a traditional empiric aminoglycoside maintenance dose and frequency based on population kinetics. Once you assess patient's body weight and creatinine clearance, the next step is to calculate population volume of distribution. And by population, we mean that these, these numbers are derived from population studies. So these are actually an estimate of what it would be in your patient. Because aminoglycosides are hydrophilic, they distribute primarily in the extracellular fluid. So fluid status is extremely important. In someone with normal fluid status, so in a general population, the estimated volume of distribution is about 0.25 liters per kilogram. Now, if someone is dehydrated, this volume of distribution will be reduced. So for the purpose of this class, we're going to use the number 0.15 liters per kilogram. On the other hand, if someone is overhydrated, the volume of distribution will be increased. So we're going to use 0.35 liters per kilogram in this class. Of course, some reasons for fluid, in, uh, fluid overload is heart failure, peritonitis, edema, ascites in patients with cirrhosis, pregnancy, and cystic fibrosis. You will learn about cirrhosis and ascites in your GI course. Now, of course, because these numbers are liters per kilogram, you have to make sure that you use the right number. So generally speaking, for a normal person, we're going to use ideal body weight. If someone weighs less than their ideal body weight, you should use their actual body weight, which will be the smaller number. And in obese patients, we're going to use adjusted body weight. By now, you know that the PKPD target for aminoglycosides are peak to MIC ratios and AUC to MIC ratios. For simplicity, we are only going to look at peak to MIC ratios in this class. So the target for peak for severe infections is 8 to 10. For moderate to mild infections is 6 to 8. For urinary tract infections is 4 to 6. 
And of course, if you use aminoglycoside for synergy in gram positive organisms, the peak will be three to five. Now, the peak is what tells you the efficacy. So the peak to MIC ratio should be these targets and that tells you efficacy. We also target trough for safety. So you, we want to have make sure that the trough is also less than two for all of these to make sure that we minimize the risk of nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. Now the dosing for tobramycin and gentamicin are identical. So these targets are for both gentamicin and tobramycin. Now if you happen to be using amikacin, so these are the different uh, different targets for amikacin. So once you figure out what you want to target for your patient, next you, we need to actually calculate elimination constant before we can come up with the dose and frequency. So again, this is an, an estimate from population. So it's not going to be exactly the same K in your patient, but you know, empirically estimation is the best thing we can do. So this is the equation we're gonna use, uh, which includes creatinine clearance, and that will give you the K for your patient. And once you get your K, you will use this equation to get tau. Tau is frequency. So this is going to tell you how frequently should you give the dose to your patient. And this is based on how, how the patient is actually able to clear it. So you basically plug in uh, peak and trough goals. So if this is a severe infection for the peak, you're going to write 10. And then for your trough, you're going to write, uh, let's say one. So you want it to be less than two. Uh, and then you plug in the K and you solve for tau and that tau will give you um, how, will tell you how frequently you want to dose it and of course then we want to make round the tau to something realistic Fre frequency uh, should be every uh, you know every 24 hours every 12 hours every 8 hours every 6 hours so those are things that are regular so you don't want to do something like every 5 hours or every 7 hours that's going to make the schedule uh, hard to follow and it's going to make it very difficult for the nurses to administer the drug. So you want to use standardized uh, frequency. So if you get a tau uh, of 5 for example, you want to round it to the closest uh, standard frequency which would be 6. So once you figure out the tau after you round it to something realistic, then you're going to use this equation to come up with the dose. So let's say if you found the tau of 5 and rounded it to 6, so you're going to use 6 in this equation. You use the k that you got from up here. You put the target peak that you want. You want you put the volume of distribution from previous uh, slides uh, and the k again. And here you put the time of infusion. So for simplicity, we're going to infuse aminoglycosides over one hour. Uh, so you just plug in one here. It is also common to use 30 minute infusion. If you were to use 30 minute infusion, you just have to put 0.5 here, which makes calculations uh, more difficult. It doesn't matter whether you do 30 minute infusion or one hour infusion, as long as you do, you get the dose right and the frequency. So I recommend that for making calculations more simple, just use the time of infusion of one. And when it comes to monitoring, we want to monitor both trough and peak. So the trough, you want to get it uh, within 30 minutes of prior, uh, prior to the third dose. So that's as close as uh, it gets to steady state. So you want to get the level before it gets to, uh, or actually close to the steady state. And then assuming that the level is at goal, you would just want to get the trough every three to five in most patients with stable renal function. Of course, more frequent monitoring would be required depending on the clinical status and also on renal uh, st status. Trough monitoring is for safety uh, and we do peak monitoring for efficacy. So the peak you want to do at least 30 minutes after the end of the infusion to allow distribution uh, to the tissues. And of course, it's also important to monitor serum creatinine due to nephrotoxicity of aminoglycoside. So in stable renal function at minimum every three days, in someone with unstable renal function, you want to monitor daily. We use cockroach gold equation for creatinine clearance. We explained pharmacology and PKPD of aminoglycosides. We also use population kinetics to 
come up with traditional empiric aminoglycoside dose and frequency. Now, the next learning objective is given the patient with a suspected gram-negative infection, determine a high-dose extended interval once daily empiric aminoglycoside maintenance dose based on population kinetics. In the previous objective, we looked at traditional dosing of aminoglycoside, so hit this purple line shows you a classic traditional dosing of aminoglycoside. So we typically want to have a, a peak of 10. Now a peak of 10 would be good only if the MIC happens to be 1. So 10 to 1 ratio. If the MIC happens to be 2, then suddenly 10 is not good enough. You need a peak of 20 in order to get the peak to MIC ratio of 10. So 20 divided by 2 would be 10. Now this causes an issue because while the peak tells you efficacy, the trough tells you toxicity. So it doesn't matter how high you go, you gotta let it go below the trough of 2 because you don't want to cause toxicity, specifically nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. So in traditional dosing every 8 hours, you're hoping that you know the peak was not too high and it would allow time for the trough to be less than 2. Now when you look at these per, uh, purple lines, you can see that the majority of the time, the levels are actually in the toxic range. So it's only a very short period of time that the kidneys get a break. So this causes an issue for safety. Also keep in mind that aminoglycoside have post-antibiotic effect, meaning that once the level goes below the MIC, the antibiotic continues to kill for up to seven or eight hours. So we can actually take advantage of that. So th that led to the concept of once daily high dose extended interval dosing. So basically the red line shows that if you give a very, very high dose of aminoglycoside, you're gonna get the very large peak and that gives you efficacy. So, you know, when you have a very large peak, you, you know, for sure you're gonna have your efficacy. And then you, because you only do it once a day, that's going to give you 24 hours for the levels to drop and then go below the toxic range. And then because of the post-antibiotic effect, it's okay to wait until the next day to give the next dose. So not only will this increase efficacy because of the higher peak that's possible now, but also reduces toxicity. When it comes to extended interval dosing of aminoglycoside, there are different ways to do it. One way is to actually use equations to calculate dosing and you set your tau to 24 hours. There are also nomograms that are established for the use of aminoglycoside. Now, when you use a nomogram, it's important to make sure you use it in patients that the nomogram has been validated. One in particular is the Hartford nomogram. So the Hartford nomogram should be avoided in patient, uh, in pediatric patient, in patient with acute uh, renal insufficiency, or if the creatinine class is less than 20, or the patient is on dialysis and has end-stage renal disease. It should not be used for mycobacterial infections, and it should not be used in patients with altered volume of distribution, such as patients with ascites, cirrhosis, uh, pregnancy, uh, severe burns, and hemodynamic instability. And it should not be used for gram-positive synergy. So for gram-positive synergy, you should always use traditional dosing. So the way it works is that you basically initially you, you use a dose of 7 mg per kilogram for gentamicin or tobramycin, and you use almost twice as much for amication, so, so 15 mg per kilo. And then for a normal renal function, this is once a day dosing. However, if the patient has... Uh, renal insufficiency, so for example, creatinine class of 40 to 59, then you set the frequency to every 36 hours, and 20 to 39, you set the frequency to every 48 hours. And of course, creatinine clearance less than 20, uh, this uh, nomogram is not recommended. And the way that you would monitor is that you actually get the random level. Instead of a peak and a trough, you, you get a random level between 6 to 14 hours after the start of the first dose and then you adjust the dose based on that level. And here's the nomogram. So this nomogram on the left is for gentamicin and tobramycin, and the one on the right is for amikacin. So let's say uh, nine hours uh, later, you got a random level, and the level happens to be three, and it happens to be here. If you were using the Q24 hour, that means the, the patient is clearing, so you continue the Q24 hour dosing.
Now, if for that very same patient, you nine hours later, you got the level that was uh, seven, because seven falls above this line of Q24, but it's within the Q36 dosing. So nine and uh, seven goes here. Instead of continuing the dose every 24 hours, you change it to every 36 hours. The same would be true if, uh, so if you nine hours later, you got the level that's, um, let's say nine, so nine and nine, you would change the frequency to every 48 hours and so on and so forth. So that's how you would monitor. And the way this was established is that um, Nicolau and colleagues actually uh, tried this dose in their patients and they, uh, they got the peak of 20 um, because the most common MIC in their institution was 2. So they wanted a peak of 20 with the MIC of 2, which would give you a peak to MIC ratio of 10. And then they just uh, looked at how quickly the patients were clearing the aminoglycosides and that's how they derived these lines. We looked at creatinine clearance, we looked at pharmacology and PKPD of aminoglycosides. We also looked at traditional and extended interval empiric dosing of aminoglycosides. Now, the last learning objective is given a patient with a gram-negative infection, select an individualized aminoglycoside dose and frequency based on serum aminoglycoside levels. Aminoglycosides follow first-order kinetics, also known as linear kinetics. And the reason this is called linear kinetics is because if you plot the natural log of aminoglycosal plasma concentration on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, then you can actually get a linear relationship between two levels. This is assuming that the two levels are after the infusion and after the distribution phase. When you first start the infusion, the levels go up very quickly till the infusion is stopped. At this point, the concentration is at peak level, followed by a rapid drop in concentration for two reasons. One, the kidney starts to clear the drug, and two, the drug is also distributing into tissue throughout the body. This is known as the distribution phase. Once the distribution phase is over, meaning that all tissue is filled with the drug, then the levels drop at a slow rate because it is now only due to clearance by the kidneys. And it's during this phase that we would like to get levels to calculate the slope of the line which would give us the elimination constant or negative k. You can use the famous equation c equals c naught times e to the negative kt and basically means that your, your final concentration equals your initial concentration times e to the negative kt and the t is the time between the, uh, the initial concentration and the final concentration. Another way of saying this is that c2 equals c1 times e to the negative kt. It's just a matter of how you label it. You can adjust the dose based on the measured uh, peak and trough or the two levels that you have by calculating a patient specific k. And the, and the way that you calculate the patient specific k is by rearranging that equation so to solve for k. So imagine that your first level is here after the distribution phase and we we're going to get that level at time one, and then you get the second concentration later during that uh, same dosing interval, and that will be at time two, and then the time that it takes between the, between the two concentration would be the delta T, or in other words, is T2 minus T1 would be delta T, and that is the T that goes into this equation. Now, keep in mind that the first level C1, it has to be at least 30 minutes after the uh, end of infusion because at the end of infusion, you have your actual uh, peak. But if you actually uh, measure the peak at the end of your infusion, then you end up with the wrong slope because, for example, if you use this as your peak, and then uh, with the C2 concentration and you calculate the slope, you can see that the slope is very different. So it would falsely give the notion that the body is clearing the aminoglycoside very quickly. Similarly, if you measure the peak and use it with C1, you're going to get a very steep slope, which would give you a false notion that the, that the body is clearing aminoglycoside very quickly, which is not true. So it's very important to get your levels at least 30 minutes after the end of infusion to make sure that it's outside of the distribution phase.
Now, what's different about this k as opposed to the k that we calculated previously is that previously we used population data to estimate the k, so that's not very specific to the patient. But now, because we have two levels from the patient, this k is specific to the patient. So we call this individualized pharmacokinetics as opposed to population-based uh, kinetics. Of course, if C1 and C2 don't are not uh, true peak and trough, you can actually extrapolate. So you can say the equation is peak equals trough times e to the kt, or an, uh, another way of saying it is trough equals peak times e to the negative kt. Again, these are all the same equation. It's just a matter of rearranging them to get what you're looking for. And of course, what you do with the k is to get the individualized vo volume of distribution. So the volume of distribution that we calculated previously was an estimate. But this time, since we have a specific K from the patient, we can actually calculate the actual volume of distribution in the patient. And what we do with the uh, next is to calculate tau again. So now instead of the estimated K, we use the actual K that we calculated in the patient. So get the new, new tau. And then using the new tau, and using the individualized K and the individualized volume of distribution, now we come up with a dose that's very accurate in the patient. Once we get the dose and tau, then we can actually verify to see if it's gonna give us, if the new dose and frequency is gonna give us the peak and trough that we want. So we can actually use this to estimate what peak we can expect from this dose and frequency. So you plug it in and it will tell you what the peak is. And then you use this peak here to see what trough it would give you. And that's how you verify to see if the dose and frequency that you're about to recommend is actually going to give you to the goal peak and trough. We will do exercises in class to do some calculations. This concludes this presentation.